Hey brothers and sisters, welcome to another video. This is Brother John. The name of this video is Times of the Gentiles. Um, this is for my fellow people of European descent. I, uh, there's a very important message. You know, if you ask, I think if you ask your average Gentile what they think it's going to be like when Jesus returns or in, you know, when this world ends and the next begins or, or whatever their conception of some sort of afterlife is or life here when Jesus returns. I think they'll tell you that he'll come, he'll be a loving God, he'll embrace the people of faith that call after his name. And um, I think of this country, the United States, they would say this is a land touched by God with his divine providence. Um, the reality is something different according to the Bible and that's what I want to talk a, a little bit about today and this is nothing about I'm not a social justice warrior um, I don't uh, I'm not going to talk about appropriation of someone's culture I'm not <clears throat> I love I like my culture I'm Greek I was raised Greek but I know what the truth of the Bible is and um, and there's some things I had to come to grips with and I want to talk about that um, the fact is, Gentiles run the earth, European white people. And uh, and if you don't know that uh, that's who Gentiles are, we'll, we'll talk about it in a second when we get to Genesis 10. This is a snippet of a smaller lesson. Of, this is a snippet of a larger lesson that I'm actually doing, that I'm going to be doing for uh, more of a traditional Bible study. But but this is for those, uh, I want you, get, um, my fellow Gentiles, to understand that um, we are in charge now. Uh, Brother Melvin from Israel, God says, uh, just look in the money. You're only going to see, only, you're going to see nobody but Gentiles on the money. Um, and if you find an Israelite or somebody like that, money is not going to be worth too much. Um, so we'll see. I know Obama wanted to put Tubman, Harriet Tubman on the money. Let's see if that happens. Anyway, um, let's start in Luke, uh, Luke chapter 21. Um, and we'll talk about, Jesus says something that kind of, where we get the title of the lesson from, and we'll take it from there. I want to kind of go quickly. I'm really cutting this down from what it will be when it's a full lesson. But we'll start in uh, Luke 21. Let's start at verse 5. And we'll get to where we're going. I'll show you uh, how it is the time of the Gentiles. Jesus spoke about it. I'll talk about what Gentiles are. And then we'll talk about uh, the visions of Daniel and how he kind of predicted, prophesied what would come in, in the way of empires and how we're still under a certain empire, whether you know it or not. So Luke 21, verse 5, And some spake of the temple how it was adorned with goodly stones and gifts. He said, he being Jesus, so... Jesus grew up in Nazareth. He was born in Bethlehem, grew up in Nazareth, a very backwoods sort of village in Israel. Here he is in the big city in Jerusalem, and his uh, apostles, who are familiar with Jerusalem, they want to show it off. Hey, look at this big building, the, the temple. And Jesus <laughs> says the following, and, and as, for the, as for these things which ye behold, the days will come in, in the which there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Well, it's not a very nice way to talk about this place they're showing off. And they asked him, verse 7, And they asked him, saying, Master, but when shall these things be? And what shall, what sign will there be when these things shall come to pass? So he starts, first thing he says, you know, normally when you people read about this conversation, they read it from Matthew 24. But there's a reason I'm in Luke 21. I'll show you in a second. But he says the same thing in both chapters. Here's in verse 8. And he said, Take heed that ye be not deceived, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and the time draweth near. Go ye not therefore after them. Well, what does that mean, many shall come? Well, it's the same thing that St. Paul said, um, but if uh, someone preach another Jesus. What do you mean, another Jesus? What do you mean, false uh, claim, people claiming their Christ? Well, the false Jesus that keep Sunday, that they, the Jesus of Sunday, and the Jesus of Christmas, and the Jesus of Easter, that's the that's the other Jesus. That's the false Jesus that they're they're claiming and, and preaching, and that's what he told you to take heed and not be deceived, um, and that's what this channel tries to do is teach the real Bible, the real Word of God. So where I want to get to, so he starts going through some woes um, and some things that would come to pass, much like Matthew 24. But where I want to get to. Um, 
is verse 24, and he's, he's prescribing all these woes. He's talking about, basically he's telling them about 70 AD, when the Romans, would they uh, built a berm around Jerusalem, basically a large trench and mound, uh, so nobody could get in or out, and they starved the Israelites out, and then they finally made a final push, attacked the city, broke the gates down, got inside, raised it to the ground, just completely destroyed the city. They burned down the temple so that they could all get all the gold and other precious metals and gems that were built into the temple. Um, basically liquid gold, liquid silver, all kinds of stuff was coming out of the temple that they took. And uh, they destroyed the whole place. Uh, so anyway, so he's talking about that. And he talks about 24, he kind of wraps up by saying the following. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Well, that tells us a few interesting things. It tells us that this is the times of the Gentiles. Uh, and we'll talk about who Gentiles are. They're people like me, European white people. Although there's dark Europeans. There's very light Europeans. There's all kinds, all different color Europeans. But uh, just like there's different colors in Hamites and Shemites. But, um, but it's interesting he said, so Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles. You know, the folks over in the land today are not Israelites. Many, if not most of them, are Shemites. Well, I can't even say most. There's many Shemites who are uh, not Israelites. Uh, close, though. And there's also a lot of Gentiles mixed in there who are trying to pass as Shemites. Uh, and that's what this verse is telling us. But let's talk about who is who. Let's go to Genesis 10. And we've got to move quick because there's a lot of stuff I want to cover in this. Um, let's go to Genesis 10. This is often referred to as the table of nations. This is the sons of Noah. God got so disturbed with the sinful nature of man, sons and daughters of Cain, that he destroyed, he drowned the entire earth except eight people. Noah and his wife, his three sons, and their wives. And everyone that's alive today descended from one of Noah's sons. Uh, so, and this is what this is about. So, chapter 10, verse 1. Now, these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And unto them were sons born after the flood, the sons of Japheth, Gomer, and Magog, and Madai, and Javan, and Tubal, and Meshach, and Tyrus. And the sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, and Riphath, and Togomar. And the sons of Javan, Elisha, and Tarshish, Kittim, and Dodanim. By these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, every one after his tongue, after their families and their nations. Okay, well you can actually go out and get the table of nations that maps... Um, the names to the regions where they went and occupied, but I can tell you that I am a son of Japheth, uh, specifically Javan became the father of the Greeks. Um, Ashkenaz, that's something you may have heard, uh, that means that's Germany. Folks, uh, sons of Ashkenaz went and, and find, founded Germany. And all these, Magog and Gog, went to Russia. So uh, these were the forefathers of European white folks. Um, by and large, it's, that's the Gentiles, not all. So the way it's used today, which is incorrect, is that anyone who's not Jewish or not an Israelite, not Jewish, they don't even use the term Israelite, they use the term Jewish. That's very interesting when you get to a, well, Revelation 2 and 9, Revelation 3 and 9. But um, not everyone who's not a Jew is, an, is a Gentile. There's Hamites too, which are the, um, and we'll talk about the Hamites because they were the first ones to run the earth. See, every son of Noah has had a chance to run this earth, and Gentiles just happen to be last. First was the sons of Ham, it talks about in verse 6, and the sons of Ham, Cush, and Mizraim, and Put, and Canaan. Well, Cush was um, Ethiopia, and uh, Mizraim was Egypt, Put was Libya, and Canaan was uh, uh, where the Israelites, is it modern day Israel is. There. It, was, it was the land of Canaan first, and guy they did something to annoy God, and he gave their land to uh, he gave their land to Israel. And the sons of Cush, Seba, and Havilah, and Sabta, and Raima, and Sabtacha, and the sons of Raima, Seba, and Dedan. And Cush begot Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. Okay, I wanted to get to Nimrod because Nimrod, Ethiopian, son of Cush, uh, he 
he was the king of Babel, Babylon, the original Babylon who built the tower. And I, if I had read into verse 11, we would have read all about him. And um, very powerful, and um, the, the Hamites ruled then, back in antiquity. And a lot of their traditions have come down that we still do to this day, even you if you're a Sunday Christian. Because every time you have a Christmas tree or a Yule log or Madonna and Child, those things or traditions out of ancient Babel. Uh, Gentiles are are said to be very intelligent, fair and expanding is what Gentiles mean, I've heard it said, but we're not terribly original. We tend to steal stuff from other people. And a lot of the traditions of of our church traditions are, are uh, amalgamation of the Levites, what we stole from their, their uh, practices, and the Hamites. A lot of the stuff we do, like even Easter, I think, goes back. Uh, if not, it goes to places like Phoenicia, other Shemites, and uh, uh, antiquity. A lot of uh, Iranian, um, the old ancient Persian goddess, although the Persians are kind of Gentiles. But anyway, uh, I digress. Um, so Ham had a chance to run, and then of course Israel in its heyday with David and Solomon. Solomon was a great kingdom under Solomon, you know, extremely wealthy. A large kingdom and so the Shemites ruled for a period of time and then the Gentiles came in and that's what we're going to talk about now. So the Gentiles are European white people. Hamites are, are African. We talked about the original Egyptians were black and the Ethiopians are still black and the Libyans are very dark skinned. The original Libyans were black. Um, so these folks, the original Canaanites were black. Um, and then the Shemites are, tend to be black, not all black, um, certainly not the folks that are uh, in the land today. They're not black, they're lighter than I am, but, uh, but they tend to be, the Israelites are black people. Um, we've talked about that and proved that in other videos. And uh, there's, of course, the Ishmaelites, who are also Shemites, and they're Arabs. They tend to be dark, much darker than me, even. Um, so, but they're all different colors, the Shemites, but uh, mostly black, for the most part, or dark. Um, so anyway, but Daniel talked about the Gentiles that would come. So let's get to Daniel 7. And uh, this is a very important chapter. Extremely important. This was, so Daniel was a prophet who lived during the original the Babylonian diaspora. And that's when King Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar came. And, um, you know, he made some deals with uh, the final kings of, uh, actually God brokered the, the last deal. And... Uh, forget the king's name, but he broke it, um, and Nebuchadnezzar came and sacked Jerusalem and just killed a lot of people and took them slavery, he took them out, out of the land, took them to Babylon, and Daniel was a prophet that was taken out of the land and taken to Babylon, ended up being a very high-ranking official in Nebuchadnezzar's court, actually him and, and uh, three of his partners were as well, um, forgive me for getting that king's name, but I know I'm going to hack it if I... Uh, Actually, I can find it real quick. I think it's in Second Kings 25. Sorry, I don't want to make this longer than it needs to be, but I, I don't want to be so ignorant looking because I don't know this guy's name. So let's find him. I want to mention something. Boy, I didn't even know his name. Hold on. It's um, uh, Zedekiah. And the king was besieged until the 11th year of his king, Zedekiah. On the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine prevailed in the city. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar starved him out. And the city was broken up, and all the men of war fled by night by the way of gate. So they made one, the, the fighting men made one attempt, one last attempt to flee Jerusalem by night, and they were caught out in the open. And, uh, and I, want to, I want to tell you what they, uh, this is what they did to King Zedekiah. Zedekiah was the king I was I'm talking about. Um, there's three of the final kings. He was the last one. But look what Nebuchadnezzar did to him. So he defied Nebuchadnezzar. First he had to deal with him. All he had to do was pay tribute. He stopped doing that. He rebelled against Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar gave him a lot of time. He could have yielded, but when he came down, he came down harsh. And look what he did in verse 7. They took, oh, let's start in verse 6. So they, they, they ran out. Let's even start at verse 5. And the army of the Chaldees, that's Nebuchadnezzar's army, pursued after the king and overtook him in the plains of Jericho and all his army were scattered from him. So they made this one. They were together. They burst out of Jerusalem. They, they were booking and the, the, the Chaldees caught them. The, uh, the Babylonians caught them. Verse 6, So they took the king and brought up him up to the king of Babylon to Riblah 
and they gave judgment upon him. So this is what Nebuchadnezzar's judgment was. This dude was cold-blooded. And they slew the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes and put out the eyes of Zedekiah and bound him with fetters of brass and carried him to Babylon. The last thing the guy ever saw was his sons being murdered in front of him by Nebuchadnezzar's guys. And then they put out his eyes. That was the last thing he would ever remember saying. Man, that's cold-blooded. So anyway... So during the time they were in uh, exile in Babylon, that's when Daniel lived. And then he wrote about this. Now, mind you, at this time, uh, the Babylonians obviously were in power. Um, so he, he predicts four empires. And, of course, the first one he predicts is, is Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon. So that's no great feat. But he predicts the next three. And uh, he successfully, you can maybe make the argument since he lived into the second one he predicted, you could not make the argument of the third and fourth. Um, so it's amazing. You know, the Bible's full of prophecy that came to pass, um, you know, at a later time. Chock full. The Jesus, the coming of Jesus. There's so many places in the Old Testament where you find Jesus. It's not, Isaiah talked about him liberally. Um, so let's go into Daniel 7. Let's read through Daniel 7. Let's start at verse 1. <clears throat> in the first year of, of Belshazzar, who was Nebuchadnezzar's son, Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. 2. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heavens drove upon the great sea. And four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. 5. And behold, another beast, a second, like to a bear, and it raised up itself on one side, and it had three ribs in the mouth of it between the teeth of it. And they said, Thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. 6. After this I beheld, and lo, another, like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. 7. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces, and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Now, in those seven verses I just read, Daniel covered... Uh, the next 2,500 years in, or more, probably, of history. Um, and uh, in, in that seventh verse, we're still living in those times. Because the ten horns, that beast would rise and fall ten times. Um, and that's what the ten horns signify, ten kings that would try to resuscitate that empire. And we'll talk about what that is in a minute. Um, so, uh, let's drop down to 15. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit in the midst of my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near unto one of them that stood by, this would be an angel, and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made known the inter made me know the interpretation of these things. 17. Um, 17, uh, okay, sorry. These great beasts, which are four, are four kings. It's really four kingdoms which shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron, and his nails of brass, which devoured, break in pieces, and stamped the residue of his feet. Let me see what else I'm supposed to be reading here. Um, <clears throat> drop down to 23. Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down, and break it in pieces. Um, let me see what else. Uh, 20, uh, 25. And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. And they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of times. So right there, what he's talking about is, um, that's the great tribulation. It's three and a half years. It's not seven years. It's completely wrong. 
uh, the Catholics got that completely wrong. That always mentions a time, which is one year, and times, which is two more years, and the dividing of time, which is a half year. Other places will say 42 months. Other places will say 1,260 days. Always three and a half years. Um, make sure I covered down on everything here. Uh, 27. In the kingdom and dominion and the greatness under the, of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Hitherto is the end. Okay, so look, let me break this down for you. Um, this is, uh, these are the four great empires that would arise, and they'd be Gentile empires. And the first one would be, um, the first one would be Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon. He was the head of gold um, that had talked about We'll go through this one by one. <clears throat> uh, and the four great beasts came up. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. Excuse me. I'm thinking of the statue that he saw. So so the lion with the eagle's wings is Babylon. And I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man. And a man's heart was given to it. Behold, another beast, a second like a bear. So this was the Medo-Persian empire that took over from the Chaldeans uh, in Babylon. So it retained the uh, nation of Babylon, but it was a different set of rulers. Um, and this was uh, Darius and Cyrus and other. These, and if you go into history, this tracks right along with history. And in fact, Daniel prophesied the end of Belshazzar, which was um, Nebuchadnezzar's son. It's a famous writing on the wall. And that's when, uh, I think it was Darius uh, the Mede took over. So, and we can read quickly in uh, another chapter where it talks about the goats. It talks about the Greeks taking over. So, I'm jumping ahead of myself. So, the Medo-Persians, the bear. So, after this I beheld, and lo, another like a leopard, which had on the back of it four wings. The beast had also four heads, and dominion was given it. This was Greece under Alexander the Great, and it's... Um, moved very swiftly and took over everything, uh, but it had four heads because Alexander died very young as soon as he had conquered everything and his four generals uh, ended up taking over for him. So that beast had four heads. And then in the last, he said, the fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong to see him. He couldn't even describe this to, you know, to an animal. Um, devoured and break in peace. And this is Rome, the great iron teeth. And uh, diverse from all the beasts. And it was diverse in that. So all the beasts would conquer you in the exact tribute. But this beast, Rome, would, um, it actually stole your religion and replaced your religion. Now, how did they do that? They took Christianity. They took our faith and they changed it. Um, we've talked about in other videos, nobody went, you know, the apostles weren't trying to go to Rome and set up a new religion. Uh, they hated Rome. Uh, Rome was the oppressor in those days, and they, many thought Jesus, one of the reasons he was killed was because he was getting the people stirred up, and people thought he was there to throw off the shackles of the Roman oppression, and that's what Rome was afraid of, and, uh, and of course he was speaking a message of the gospel of God, and that's what the church was afraid of, so that's why they conspired to kill him. And that's how he was killed from, it was the church that did it, they supplied the impetus, but it was the Roman state that carried it out. And if you read in the Bible, they actually threatened uh, an uprising. They threatened uh, Pilate with an uprising. And they talked about, we have no friend but Caesar. You know, they talk about their legion. We have no king, excuse me, but Caesar. They talk about their legion and they, they threaten Pilate with the, the specter of Jesus getting the people in uproar against Rome. So, but Rome, yet Rome somehow managed to have Christian become the capital of Christianity. How is that? Well, that's the nature of this fourth beast, which is Rome. Let's see if I can quickly find um, another one of the Daniel... Uh, chapters so that we can um, deal with that um, yeah so he's if you go into chapter 8 so on the vision came to pass I was in Shushan in the palace in the prosperance of Elam 3 and then I lifted up mine eyes and saw and behold there stood a great the river a ram which had two horns and the two horns were high but one was higher than the other and the higher came up last and I saw the ram pushing westward, northward, and southward, so that no beast might stand before him. Neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand. As I was considering, a he-goat came 
from the west on the face of the whole earth and touched not the ground and the ghost had a notable horn between his eyes so let me break that down the ram is the Medo-Persian has two horns one's greater so the Medes were first but then the Persians took over and they were the more significant portion of that empire but then here comes the he-goat and he's moving so quickly that he's not even touching the ground and that's how quickly Alexander the Great once he took over Greece and assembled his armies he took over the world so quickly it was like in an eye blank that's that's why this he-goat's not even touching the ground it was so quick and when they said um, uh, touched not the ground and the goat had a notable horn between his eyes that's Alexander the Great and he came to the ram that had two horns which I had seen standing before the river and ran unto him and in the fury of his power and I saw him come close unto the ram and he was moved with color against him and smote the ram and break his two horns and there was no power in the ram to stand before him but he cast him down to the ground and stamped upon him and there was none that could deliver the ram out of his hand and that was Alexander taken over um, and then it says, Therefore the he-goat waxed very great, and when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and for it came up four notable ones towards the four winds of heaven. And that's talking about Alexander. He was the notable horn, but he died right away. And the four horns, his four generals, took over. Now how, this was Daniel, this, that was way after Daniel. How would he know this to prophecy this? Um, and look at this. Look, they even break it down for him. <coughs> Um, he's talking about an angel starting. So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid and fell upon my face. But he said unto me, Understand, O son of man, for a time at the end of the shall be the vision. Now as he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep of my face towards the ground, but he touched me and set me upright. 19. And he said, Behold, I will make thee know what shall be the last end of the indignation. For at that time appointed the end shall be. The ram which thou sawest having two horns are the kings of Media and Persia. And the rough goat is the king of Grecia. And the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. And that was Alexander. He, he unified Greece. Uh, they, his father was the king of Macedonia, Athens, and Sparta. Down south were city-states. He unified it all. So he was the first king of Greece. So he unified Greece. Um, and that's what they, and they, so they tell you exactly who he is in Daniel 8. So I've dwelt too long in Daniel, but he called the, the four great empires. Now Rome, let's talk about Rome. Ten horns that would rise and fall ten times. We're still in the time of Rome. Uh, what do you mean, Brother John? Rome's ancient. It, the fall of Rome was, is well known. Well, the fall of Rome, but not the fall of Roman culture. Um, where is the Vatican located? It's located in Rome, isn't it? See, the little horn that would speak great things that we read about in Daniel 7, um, that, would be, that would be the religious horn that would come up. And let me, and, and, and let me read something profound from that. Um, Twenty-five, And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time of times and dividing of times. He's already done it. What do you mean, John? He's already changed times and laws. What does that mean? What does that mean? Well, the Sabbath is the seventh day, but he has made it, the Vatican made it the first day. Well, it was actually the Roman Emperor Constantine in 321 AD made it Sunday. And then the Vatican followed suit about less than a century later. Um, times and laws. What do you mean laws? Well, they don't follow the Ten Commandments. They don't follow all of them. They remove the, the one that said, Thou shalt make no image, no graven image. That's gone. They got these uh, holidays called Christmas and Easter and All Saints Day. None of that stuff's in the Bible. Where did that come from? So he changed times and laws already. Um, he's already done those things, and it's going to get worse before it gets better. So, uh, and I'm going to tell you how it's going to be um, in the future. We're going to touch on it quickly. Um, let's go to Isaiah 13. So this is what's going to happen. So let me speak plainly. The Gentiles run this world. We run everything about it. It's just the truth. And, but it will not always be that way. And when the Lord returns, he's going to gather Israel. Those black people we call African Americans, and he's going to make war. Actually, we, 
the nations, the, the, the Gentile and Hamite uh, nations, but mostly the Gentile nations, will make will think it's an alien invasion when Jesus comes back and they will actually try to fight against him and he's going to plead for, with them. And when he pleads, he's not asking please, he's going to be killing some people. They say the blood's going to be up to the horse, horse's bridle and um, there will be so many dead bodies, the slain of the Lord will be from one end of the earth to the other. Um, when he returns and uh, and the nations especially the nations that have been in power will no longer be the nations that are running things it will be Jesus's government so we're going to instantly go from Gentile running the world to Israelites running the world uh, and we're going to talk about what that will look like and I'm not again this isn't a social justice thing I'm not trying to hate on my own kind or anything I'm just telling you what the book says so let's go to Isaiah We'll start at 13. Isaiah 13. I think it's 13 I want to go to. I'm pretty sure in verse 9. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. So much for your... Flush, fluffy Jesus, right, that loves everyone. So much for come as you are. He's going to destroy the sinners out of it. Well, who are the sinners, John? The sinners are everyone who transgressed the law of God. What do you mean? What is the law of God? The loyal, uh, law, the loyal royal law of God, to start with. The Ten Commandments. The dietary law. Those are the sinners. You don't follow that stuff. Um, let's see. What else did I want to read? 13 and 9. Where did I want to go from there? Through 11 to 10 for the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light They're very consistent with revelation how the stars are going to fall out the, the sun shall be darkened and it's going forth and the moon shall not cause her light to shine that's exactly what's going to happen when Jesus returns sun and the moon go dark stars fall 11 and I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity and I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. Um, he's going to deal with people who are arrogant. He's going to deal with people who have been arrogant in their sin and been haughty. Um, let's go to verse 14. And it shall be as the chaste row and as a sheep that no man taketh up. They shall every man turn to his own people and flee everyone into his own land. So, America isn't mentioned in the Bible, but this one verse tends to make me think of America, because America is the smelting pot, right? And we're from all over the place. But this verse is telling us that uh, every man shall return to his own people. So me, instance, for instance, if I was here, if I was not in the truth when Jesus returns, I would flee to Greece, to my own people in Greece. <laughs> 15, everyone that is found shall be thrust through and everyone that is joined into them shall fall by the sword. That means if well, if he gets back and you're not in where you're supposed to be, you're going to be getting thrust through with the sword. Uh, the, their children also shall be dashed to pieces before their eyes. And their houses shall be spoiled and their wives ravished. Um, Behold, I will stir up the Medes against them, which shall not regard silver as for gold. They shall not delight in This is talking about the Great Tribulation, the, the war at the end. The Medes are the, the Russians. The, the Medes and the Persians, that Medo-Persians. That's why Russia and Iran get along to, so well, even to this day. Um, so, <clears throat> let's drop down to verse 25. Is there a verse 25? There's not a verse 25. I'm in the wrong place. I think I read through, I read all that that I wanted to read. So let's now go to Isaiah 14, 1 and 2. For the Lord will have mercy on Jacob and will yet choose Israel and set them in their own land and the strangers shall be joined with them and they shall cleave to the house of Jacob. We're going to read to other places. It's going to be a great phenomenon that when Jesus comes back and we f f finally see who Israel is, that uh, people will be cleaving to them. They'll be, hey, my good friend. And that's and you're going to read that over and over. A lot of people will be saying, hey, let us come with you because we know that you're the Lord's people. Um, but it's not going to be all roses for a lot of people. Verse 2, And the people shall take them and bring them to their place, and the house of Israel shall possess them in the land of the Lord for servants and handmaids. 
and they shall take them captives whose captives they were, and they shall rule over their oppressors. That's a very key verse. Um, a lot of people use it spitefully and hatefully, but it's and it's there, and there's no two ways around it. And they will take them captives. Here's the key whose captives they were, and they shall rule over their oppressors. So if you're one of those people that you always have a joke and a snide remark about African Americans, and you uh, always look at them and say, look at them, look, they can't get their act together, and always think, treating them second class, and you're always uh, uh, feeling superior, um, that's the nature of people that oppressed them back in the day, and they're going to turn the tables. The tables will be turned when they come back, so it's very clear that you understand what this is telling you. Um, let's go to Zechariah 1. Read some more about uh, this day that Gentiles will be fulfilled. Time of the Gentiles. Zechariah, one of these books towards the end. Back here. Let me find it. It's always buried in. Not very long, I don't think. Let's see if I can find it. There's Zechariah, there it is. Zechariah 1 and 14 and 15. Let's see what that says. This talks about um, why the Lord is upset with the nations that have been dealing with Israel. 14. So the angel that communed with me said unto me, Cry thou, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts. I am jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with a great jealousy, 15. And I am very sore displeased with the heathen, which means the nations, that are at ease. For I was but a little displeased, and they helped forward the affliction. He says, you know, I was a little upset with my people. Yeah, and I wanted them to have some punishment, but these people got buck wild with it. They, uh, they, uh, they went to no end. They really dis mistreated my people and... and there's going to be a payback. So that's the rationale. Let's go to Zechariah 8. Oh, passed it. Uh, passed it. Zechariah 8 and verse 20. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, It shall yet come to pass that there shall come people in the inhabitants of many cities. And the inhabitants of one city shall go to another, saying, let us go speedily to praise before the Lord and to seek the Lord of hosts. I will go also. Yea, many people and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to pray before the Lord. Um, 23. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, In those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold of, out of all languages of the nations, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, We will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. And that's really going to happen. So it's not about, it's not all about turning the tables. It's about people realizing that the, who the real people of God are and wanting to say, Hey, take us, we, you know, show us favor. Um, but a lot of times it will be that they've, uh, they've not treated them so well. Let me go back to Isaiah for a second. Go to 49. I wrote these down forgetting what they're in some cases. Um, this is talking about, um, we're going to get into some Isaiah, how it talks about uh, Gentiles um, and how he, Lord God will, will reach out to them. Uh, 22. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will lift up mine hand to the Gentiles and set up my standard to the people. And they shall bring the son, thy sons in their arms, and thy daughters shall be carried upon their shoulders. Again, talking about how the Gentiles will be bringing, um, bringing Israelites back. Uh, and honestly, it will be to, to curry favor in a lot of cases. Let's go to Isaiah 60. Let's go to verse 9. Surely the isles shall wait for me. Whenever they talk about the isles, they're talking about Gentiles. Surely the in most cases, most always cases. Surely the isles shall wait for me in the ships of Tarshish first to bring thy sons from far, their silver and their gold with them unto the name of the Lord thy God and to the Holy One of Israel because he hath glorified thee. 10. And the sons of strangers shall build up thy walls and, and their kings shall minister unto thee. 
For in my wrath I smote thee, but in my favor have I had mercy on thee. And it's just talking about how uh, the nations will come and start serving and, and uh, benefiting the Israelites in Israel. Verse 12, For the nation and kingdom that will not serve thee shall perish. Yea, those nations shall be utterly wasted. So this is to Jesus, talking to Jesus. So we're in, in talking to Israel as well. So we, they, we have to... Nations will have to serve them. See, everything's going to flip over. Um, one last place, Isaiah 66. At least last place in Isaiah 23 and 24. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. And they shall go forth so that all nations once a year will have to go to Jerusalem and pay homage to, uh, to Jesus. And if they don't go, they will have drought in their land and not be able to eat because it won't rain. But there's another task they'll have to do when they get up there in 24. And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that transgressed against me, for their worm shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. And that's the lake of fire. Um, so... Excuse a long pause. I, I got to cut to the chase because it's already a long video. But um, the Gentiles will be will be serving them, um, whose captives they were. So there's a way to avoid this, and the way to avoid this is to repent of your sins, to repent the sins that our fathers have done to Israel, and to um, become part of Israel. And how do you do that? And it's not. It's not losing who you are, it's gaining who, it's, it's losing what you shouldn't be in the first place. The pride, pride, the pride and the haughtiness, uh, it's time to be humble and to repent of our sins and to embrace. See, um, only, he says, I will yet choose Israel, and he's not going, he, the Lord, is not going to choose other nations. He will adopt other nations, and they'll all become Israel, um, and that's the key to it. So we strangers can become part of Israel. We just need to repent and be baptized and keep his commandments. You see, when the first resurrection comes, if I've already gone to sleep, I'm going to wake up and become a god. And uh, it's not going to be about me serving and other people. I'll just be God like the other new gods that will be created. Uh, and, and, uh, and if you serve the Lord, um, he will accept you. And I'll read that right now in Isaiah 56. I lied. I said we were done with Isaiah, but we're not. It's the last place. Um, because, yeah, if you're haughty, if you look down, if you mistreat Israel, if you have perpetuated their poverty, perpetuated their imprisonment, perpetuated their murders, if you've done anything to keep them oppressed, if you're a slum lord, in, uh, slum landlord, if you, um, you know, if you constantly double deal and treat them poorly, exploit them for their labor, well, yeah, you're going to be, the tables are going to be turned, and you're going to be serving them. And uh, but and uh, and the nations that have, have oppressed them will be serving them. But if you repent, if you recognize that they're the children of God, and if you really worship this God and the truth of who this God is, um, then I don't think you have anything to fear as a stranger. I don't. Let's go to Isaiah 56, chapter 1. Thus saith the Lord, Keep ye judgment and do justice, for my salvation is near to come and my righteousness to be revealed. Blessed is the man that doeth this and the son of a man that layeth hold of it, on it, that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and keepeth his hand from doing any evil. Neither let the son of the stranger, that's me, that hath joined himself to the Lord, speak, saying, The Lord hath utterly separated me from his people. Neither let the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. Now let's drop down to verse 6. Also the sons of the stranger that join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants. Everyone that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and taketh hold of my covenant. 7. Even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon my altar, for mine house shall be called an house of prayer for all people. So my friends, times of the Gentiles are coming to an end. 
it's not going to be good unless you repent, do the will of the Father, keep His commandments, um, and then He will accept you. Uh, otherwise, if you maintain your pride and your arrogance, uh, tables are going to turn. It's not going to be very pretty. We ask this as we ask all things in Jesus' name. Amen.